happened sooner or later, but I just died and went to heaven. <laughs> Couldn't help but just look around this morning. And so many faces that I know, so many wonderful people who serve the Lord. And now I know why we have this lectureship. It's just to see you come back and to study God's Word. God well, bless you for coming. We're so glad you're here. You're in a congregation this morning that's at peace. So I want each of you to ask God to make sure that the devil doesn't find out about it. Because he will try to trouble us, no doubt. A change in the schedule because of a typo that I did not catch. The singing this afternoon is not at 3.30. It's at 4.30. So if you'll mark that, please. The singing this afternoon is at 4.30. Also, teens, we will be meeting in your classes this week in the Cates Chapel in the Educational Building. Uh, if you don't know where that is, Matt can tell you or I can tell you, but it's in the uh, Educational Building of the Forest Hill Church of Christ, which is sort of a Six hundred and six pages of hope. I hope you can get a book this year. You'll enjoy it. Tremendous sermons on hope from various angles. Build your hopes on the eternal God. Our speaker this morning is very much like a son to me. He's very rebellious. <laughs> He and his wife, Celicia, are our <coughs> special couple here at Forest Hill. And I want to emphasize that word special. Celicia doesn't get much press, press but she is a, a picture of a preacher's wife, a local preacher's wife. Celicia, we're so grateful for you and what you do here. In fact, we're grateful that you can keep him straight at all. <laughs> Very how long have you been here? 17 years. Second, he was the associate here with Brother Whitaker years ago. He's an instructor at the Memphis School of Preaching along with his duties here at Forest Hill. And uh, graduated from the Memphis School of Preaching but has a BA from the University of Alabama <coughs> in political science. Barry began preaching in 1986. He and his wife, Celicia, have three beautiful children, Kaysa, Miranda, and Vita. When Barry and I talked about these things, and he and Brother Clark always, uh, we sit down and discuss about these subjects and preachers, Barry said he wanted to preach on the subject this morning, to build your hopes on the eternal God. Very <coughs> good. I actually thought that I was being asked to speak for eternity. That's why I chose this. <laughs> and it brought to my mind when someone asked me, what is your subject? I was just glad the person didn't ask, how long are you going to speak? And I would have said eternity or eternity. Many, many years ago, when I was the associate preacher at Knight Arnold, I was in my mid-twenties, and some individuals, they didn't really frighten me, but I just had a lot of respect. I never crossed these individuals at all. Among them, Brother Roy Hearn and Brother E. L. Whitaker. Brother Hearn was the director of the school at one time, and Brother... Whitaker, as mentioned early, earlier, was our longtime preacher for 33 years. Brother Whitaker had retired from the pulpit, and I can recall he was sitting toward the back of the auditorium. And I was coming down the center aisle when he asked me to come over and talk with him just a moment. 
He said, Brother Hearn is seated down on the front row. He's scheduled to leave the prayer in just a moment. Go tell him that his prayer does not have to be eternal to be immortal. <laughs> I said, no way. <laughs> Let me also add this, that regarding the afternoon song service, it is correct in your pew program, which you have before. But we do that over here, you see. <laughs> the mistake is across the way. <laughs> but anyway. There are those who have greatly influenced my life. Many of whom are still living, but many are not. And I think about those who have been on this platform already today like Brother Moser Sr. and Brother David Sane. I look up to them. I respect them. And when I pray, I always pray that I can, can be more like these men. Because I see in them my Lord, and they are my mentors. Where would I be without them? You know Brother Sane, you know Brother Mosier, but you probably never met my Uncle Earl English. Great uncle. Thrilled when he heard I was coming to Memphis School to preach. Though a meat cutter by trade, he, he had preached for many, many years. And one of the finest Bible students that I ever knew. And I recall that Every time that I would go home to Northeast Alabama and visit, it was expected that I would go see Uncle Earl. I would not dare let him know that I had come in and didn't visit with him. He'd be very upset. But I love to meet with him. I love to talk with him, but I like to listen to him. On one occasion during those days, I stopped by his house. It was the middle of summer. It was very, very hot afternoon. Not warm, but hot. He was sitting on his front porch and he had a fan going on that front porch so he could cool off. Big glass of water. As I stepped up on the porch. I thought he was asleep. His eyes were closed. But he heard me as I got closer to him and he opened his eyes. A big smile. Warm hug. He was glad to see me. He said, you know what I've been doing? I said, what have you been doing? He said, I've been thinking about eternity. What a concept, he said. How do you, how do you grasp it? V.P. Black said, let a man think about eternity long enough and he'll do one of two things. Either he will get his heart right with God or he'll go start raving mad. One of the two. And then consider that as Christians we often ask the question, why don't more people respond in obedience to the gospel of Christ? And we know one reason, for sure. Not enough people in our world today are thinking about eternity. That's the reason. Christianity is not some help, self-help religion, is it? It's more than that. It wasn't just crafted by men to help us get through life. But rather, Christianity was formulated by an eternal God, founded upon His eternal principles, and for the benefit of eternal beings. You see, Christianity is not necessarily about making life easier here on earth. In some ways it does, in some ways it does not. But really what Christianity is all about is getting hearts and lives and minds ready for what? Eternity. That's what Christianity is all about. But we define our subject. What is eternity? It is that which is everlasting. Simple to define. It's that which is forever. It is an expanse that has no beginning and has no ending. 
And so sometimes we hear a sermon that perhaps is entitled, Where Will You Spend Eternity? Interesting idea. Because I don't know how you spend eternity. I used to hear it like this when I was a boy, and I, I understood the point of the preachers. The illustration was something like this. Suppose there was a stream tied from the earth to the sun. And we placed a grain of sand on the back of a little ant. And that little ant traveled with that grain of, of sand all the way to the sun and back. Once that little ant had taken every grain of sand on earth and taken it to the sun, then the preacher would say, the sun would just be rising in eternity. The illustration will not work. It's still talking about time, isn't it? God is not confined by time, is He? Because He's an eternal being. A day with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years, that's one day. 2 Peter 3.8 God cannot be limited by time. He is an eternal being. Remember in the 90th Psalm, verses 1 and 2, it is Moses who is speaking. And he says, Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, wherever Thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. In the epic film, The Ten Commandments, Cecil B. DeMille, who played the role of Moses. And of course it would be Charlton Heston. No one had a greater grasp of the English language than Charlton Heston. No one had a richer, warmer voice to be the voice of God than Charlton Heston, unless it was David Profater. But Charlton Heston, he quoted this passage right after the Egyptians were drowned in the Red Sea. There he is on the, the bank on the other side of the, of the sea and he lifts up his eyes and he says, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. I was in Washington, D.C. about 25 years ago and attending a particular conference and one of the speakers was Charles Nesta. And when he was finished, I started going in the direction of the lectern a friend said, where are you going? You're going to meet Charlton Heston? I said, no, I'm going to meet Moses. <laughs> and even in that movie, The Ten Commandments, the voice of, of Moses, or the voice of God was Charlton Heston. That seems right to me. What wonderful, beautiful poetry. What wonderful truth. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. In Isaiah, we find this in Isaiah 57, 15. He is the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. And then notice in Romans chapter 1, listen to the great apostle Paul as he speaks about the divine Godhead in verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. So I believe in the eternal Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But do I fully understand it? Children will ask, explain this to us, and we can't explain it. When we explain something, generally we can explain something by comparing this item with this item but you cannot compare this Godhead with this Godhead. There is only one. Uncle Earl couldn't fully understand it. 
He was there deep in meditation trying to grasp the idea of eternity and an eternal God. And all I can say is the same thing the psalmist said. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain to it. We set forth here at the opening of our lectureship God who is eternal. He is eternal in his being. Don't forget that. There is no fiendish being that ever can topple God from his throne. He is not only eternal in his being, he is eternal in his power. He is eternal in his character. Three beings compose the divine Godhead. Three, because each one that is a member of the Godhead has the characteristics of deity. All three are eternal beings. God the Father, Deuteronomy 33, 27. Christ Jesus, the Word who became flesh, John 1, 1 through 3 and verse 14. The Holy Spirit is called the eternal spirit in Hebrews 9, 14. And so it is that the eternal God has eternal principles by which he operates. Let's think of a couple this morning. Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. That is an eternal principle, isn't it? One translation says, living by God's principles promotes a nation to greatness. Violating those principles will bring a nation to shame. And that passage can refer to the United States of America or any nation. Righteousness is what exalts a nation to greatness. Sin is the reproach of any people. That, my friends, is an eternal principle. It will not be violated. It will be demonstrated. Galatians 6 6 and 7, be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. That is an eternal principle. It cannot be violated. It will just be demonstrated. God operates by eternal principles. But then here's something very special to consider. We are made in his image. Let us make man in our image. Every man, every woman, every boy and girl in this room made in the image of God. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul, Genesis 2-7. So those of us gathered here today, like all the people of the world, were not made a little above the apes, but rather a little lower than the angels made in the image of God. Last summer, our family adopted from the Germantown Animal Shelter a little dog we call Teddy. He's half Cocker Spaniel. We're not sure about the other half. We just know we love him. And the members here at Forest Hills said, that the age of miracles, they have not ceased. Barry Grider took a dog into his home. <laughs> I did that because I love my children. They were begging for a dog. Now they go about their business and Teddy and I hang out together. We're good friends. <laughs> I love Teddy and he loves me. You know, Teddy, it doesn't take a lot to please him. Sometimes it does my children. But you know, uh, it doesn't take a whole lot to feed him. Give him a pat on the head. Let him chase his tail. He's happy. You think about it. So many people in our world today, uh, give them plenty to eat so they'll be satisfied with food. They give them a pat on the head and a little affection and something to chase or conquer. Most people are happy, right? But after it's all over, what have you got? Just a good dog's life. That's all you've got. Lo, Teddy, we love him, but Teddy knows nothing about 
his beginning. He knows not that, that there's something called death out there before him, that he's not always going to exist. He's not really sure who we are, except he knows who feeds him and who shows him affection and who gives him a place to rest. And one day it'll all be over for Teddy. It's going to break our hearts. But it'll be over. It's not that way for you and me. Because we've been created in the image of the Almighty. Now let me give you a profound thought that you've heard before. But I want you to think about it because it is profound. We will never cease to exist. Never. We're here. We're alive. And there will never be a time when we will cease to exist. And our humanity has a hard time contemplating eternity. And yet in our hearts, what do we know? There's something more. There's something more. Man is the only one who thinks that way. And, and, and don't be deceived. Every atheist has thought about it. Privately in his mind, deep down in the dark recesses of his soul, wonder if those Christians have something here. I heard of a place where they are making more converts among senior citizens than in any other age group. And when I asked about that, the preacher said, it's understandable. He said, brethren, better be taking advantage of the situation. Well, why? Help me to understand. Why senior citizens? He says, because for a whole uh, generation or two, people have been living their lives without God, and then they get old and think, maybe I ought to do something, right? Maybe I ought to do something about my soul. Maybe there is something to this about heaven and hell, and maybe Jesus is coming again. Maybe I need to get right with God. So we don't give up on people. God has set eternity in our hearts. We know there is something more. But you see, what people don't realize is while they're searching and they never can find full satisfaction, they don't realize this, do they? And so they keep going through these uh, life changes and they keep looking for something different. And what used to satisfy doesn't satisfy anymore. So they move on to something else. And we create what's called bucket list. And we say, I've got to check this off and I've got to do this. And boy, if I can get this done, I'll really be happy to get And they finally get old and still not happy. My son knows exactly what the next statement is going to be. He's heard it too many times. The things of this world were never intended to satisfy our souls. Not when you're made in the image of God. The things of this world won't satisfy. Abraham learned that lesson, lesson didn't he? So he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Moses learned that lesson, didn't he? Because he said, I, I would rather suffer reproach for Christ than to enjoy the pleasures of, a, of, of sin for a season. He had respect under the recompense of the reward. It's better to suffer while here on earth than suffer later on. It's better to suffer now and enjoy heaven and eternal bliss with Christ. Some have contemplated eternity. Abraham did and Moses did. And our hearts cry out for more. Go back to that psalm again, Psalm 90. We read verses 1 and 2. Let's read verse 10. Brother Moser, whenever I read this particular verse, I'm so glad that's not the only verse in the Bible. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. If by reason of strength they be fourscore years, eighty, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it's soon cut off and we fly away. It's over. It's over. What a sad verse. It's true, but thankful it's not the only truth, right? It's inspired, but I'm thankful that it's not the only passage that is inspired. Listen to this. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. You've heard it. Verse 1 beginning. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no more pleasure in them. I used not to understand that, but I'm getting the point more and more. 
When I heard an aged aunt of mine say one time when she heard I was going on a cruise, she said, I would have enjoyed that at one time. She said, but it doesn't make any difference to me anymore. You ever thought about the things you one time, once really enjoyed? That doesn't make, doesn't make a, uh, any difference anymore. You don't really care about it anymore. No. Something's happening. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened. Why does Grandpa seem to have such a bad attitude, never is in a good mood? He's getting old. He's getting old. <laughs> why is it that why is it that Grandpa gets sick and then he gets well, and then he's sick again? Grandpa's getting old. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble. Mama, why does Grandpa always shake like this? And the strong men shall bow themselves. Mom, why is it that, that, that Grandpa's all bent over? He's getting old. And the grinders cease because they are few. Mama, I saw Grandpa take out his teeth and put them in a jar. <laughs> Honey, he's getting old. And those that look out the windows be darkened. So what is that way out there? I can't hardly see. What is right in front of you, Grandpa? Grandpa's getting old. And the doors shall be shut in the streets. Grandpa, you want to go with us? I just stay here. When the sound of the grinding is, is low. Huh? Grandpa's old. And he shall rise up at the voice of a bird. Mama, why is it when Grandpa, being retired, still gets up 5 o'clock in the morning? Honey, Grandpa's been getting up all through the night. You just didn't know it. <laughs> He's getting old. When they shall be afraid of that which is high. Son, will you step up there on that and get that for Grandpa? I just can't do that anymore. Grandpa's getting old. Fear shall come, shall be in the way. We haven't seen you at service lately, haven't you heard? Grandpa says, I can't drive anymore. Grandpa, his hair is not just gray anymore. It's white. The almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden. Son, get that for me. Grandpa can't lift it. Desire shall fail. He gets to the point he doesn't want to eat. He doesn't want to go outside. He just wants to stay in bed because Grandpa's going to his long home. It's almost over. The mourners go about the streets. It could be any time. The family's planning the funeral. But the wise man goes on to say, Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was. But the Spirit shall return to God. Oh, my friends, there's our dual nature. Not all of me will go in the grave. For the Spirit shall return unto my God. And so Jesus on one occasion says, let me just pull back a curtain a little bit and let me give you an idea of what it's going to be like over there. You see, there was this rich man and there was this man named Lazarus. And the rich man cared very little about, about others he certainly didn't care about people like Lazarus. And God would say he didn't care anything about me. He just cared about himself. And here is that rich man. Now look where he is. He's in torment. And he's fully conscious they're in torment. Here is a man who has the same identity, though he's in torment. Here is a man who still has his memory, though he's still in torment. Here is a man who still has feelings, but he's still in torment, in eternity. In this great expanse, there are two distinct places where souls shall exist. And it's summarized by our Lord in Matthew 25, 46, stated succinctly, These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. 
when a criminal stands before a judge and he hears the sentence read, guilty. 25 years in prison, and there he's taken away. But there in his cell, he has a calendar. And when he's completed his first day, he can say, there's day one completed. Now there are this many years, this many months, this many days left. And eventually he'll get to the point where all he has to say, just a few more days left, and I get out. But my friends, when one goes into hell, he doesn't mark off day one and says, I just have this many days left because hell is eternal. Because you see, God is eternal and we're made in the image of God. But flip the coin over. On the other hand, heaven is eternal because God is eternal. And we're made in the image of God. And John 3.15 says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Eternity. That great expanse of which we are a part. And Paul certainly had confidence that he was going to keep on living. For he says, I'm now ready to be offered. The time of my departure at hand. Well, I fought a good fight. I've, I've kept the faith, finished my course, I kept the faith. Henceforth there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me in that day. Not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. And so, as we consider being eternal or living throughout eternity, let's understand why it is that we have to get out of this body and maybe it will help us all have a better attitude toward that thing called death. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. Paul is giving hope to the brethren. And he says, Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. All of us who preach, and many others who do not preach, faithful children of God have gone to the hospital to visit someone who is very, very sick, aged, near the point of death, and we want to do what? We want to encourage, only to leave having been encouraged. And so we speak to the person and we have a look of despair on our faces because we're despairing for the person. And yet that child of God still has a glimmer of hope in the eye and a smile on the face. Because you see, on the inside, that soul has been renewed day after day after day after day. The soul is young. Uh, the person is still young at heart because the soul is still young. It's renewed, refreshed day after day after day. But the body's not cooperating, is it? It's decaying, it's dying. And so it is at some particular point. God says it's time to get my child out of that old dying, decaying body. Let me give my child a new body that will last forever. One that will house the spirits of my people forever and ever and ever. What do you call forever and ever and ever? You call it eternity. So I close the message by quoting the Apostle Paul. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Remember, we're going to be somewhere forever. That can't be changed. And where will it be? Two destinations. We make the choice. 
And Christ Jesus has died for our souls because he wants us to live with him. And this morning, if you are a penitent believer ready to confess Jesus as the Son of God, ready to be baptized for the remission of your sins, why not come? If you as a child of God are concerned about your soul and your relationship with God, why not come and let's join together in prayer? We're going to be somewhere forever. And while we sing the invitation song, let us be very sobering and thoughtful as we sing the words of this great hymn and as we think about our own souls and where we will spend eternity. Let's stand and sing.